I'm delighted to welcome you this morning to the online service for Southport Church of the Nazarene this Sunday morning, May 3rd. It has been a great many weeks, seven or eight, since we have met as a congregation here in this sanctuary where I am this morning, and you are not. And uh, we thought by this time that we might be back in our sanctuary for services, but at this point, it doesn't look like that is happening. And so we'll be in contact, we'll be in touch, and we'll give you news as soon as we're allowed to come back and have services together. But for now, let's worship together this morning. Let's invite the Spirit's presence to come and to meet with us and to minister to our hearts. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for this another day that you've given to us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness to each one of us. Lord, our great is thy faithfulness, and we appreciate your goodness to each one of us during this time of the coronavirus. We're so glad that our God is still in, in control. You know all things. You, you know all the you know, possibilities that are going on with this uh, disease. But Lord, our faith is in you, and we know, Lord, that you are, are able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we're able to ask for to think according to the power of God that works in us. Father, we pray for each one of those in our church family this morning who have had situations and illnesses and, and uh, even death in the family. We pray you'll comfort them and help them and touch them this morning, we pray. You know all about each one this morning. We pray your blessing upon them we know that you're the great uh, physician, you're the balm of Gilead, and you're still in control, and we love you this morning for that. We're so glad, Father, for the possibilities that are ours, and we're looking to you for grace and help in the future days that lie ahead. Father, we pray you bless the service this morning. Would you bless the singing, the message of the hour? We pray your blessing upon each one of the members of the church. Have thy way in each of our lives and help us, Lord, to always glorify you in all that you do. And we'll praise you, for we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together this morning. Come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Give him praise, give him praise. Come to his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Voices raise, your voices raise. Give glory and honor and power. Thanksgiving in your heart and give him praise. Let's give him praise. Come into his presence with thanksgiving in your heart. Your voice is raised. Your voice is raised. Give glory and honor. into the house of the Lord. Yes, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the 
the sacrifices of thanksgiving, and we offer up to the sacrifices of joy. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath shall never lose its power till all the ransom church of God be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more be saved to sin no more till Since by faith I saw the stream by flowing wounds supply, this redeeming love has been my thing, and it shall be till I die. Oh, yes, it shall be till I die, and shall be till. Stammering tongue lies silent in the grave. Then, in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then, in
just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing, Lord, to Thee. And should I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary with His blood. Save me with his power, he has raised me to God be the glory for the things he has done. Then sings my soul. Sings my soul, my 
Savior God today. How great the for this day. We're thankful, dear Father, for the opportunity we have to call upon you. And Lord, even though we can't meet in your name, dear God, we know that you are, you will help us, dear Father, through this time, that you will give us understanding, that you will guide us and lead us. We're thankful, dear God, for how you have helped the church to do work at that, um, uh, of just, of, of just uh, making the finances and, and keeping everything going. We pray, dear God, that you'll continue to bless our ministers be those in leadership, dear Father, give them wisdom. And then, Lord, for those that are not able to get out, I pray, dear God, that you will touch them today. I pray you'll be with those, dear God, that, have, that are sick with uh, other things, dear Father, that, that, that are causing adverse problems. I pray that you'll guide and direct us, dear God, as a church, dear God, that we might pray for them and lift them up. I ask, dear Father, that you will be with uh, our pastors today, dear God. Watch over them. Your Pastor Sweezy, dear God. Keep your hand upon him, dear God, and Tim, and and Pastor Tim, dear God, direct and guide him, dear God, thankful for his music and, and trying to keep us uh, inspired with uh, with song. And I pray for Pastor Mike, dear God, that you'll bless him today and guide and direct them. And each one of these men, dear God, as they're trying to stand in the gap, dear God, and to help and to lead the church. And, and Lord, we're, this is something new for us. We're not sure of exactly what it is, but Lord, we pray that you'll help us, dear God, to be aware of your presence. Help us, dear God, be mindful of you, be those that are teaching Sunday school class and trying to get in contact with people. And Lord, help us, dear God, to understand that, that you know all about this, dear God. It's not anything new. And we pray that you will help us, dear God, to walk in the center of your will and to run to adversity, dear God, to, that we might help others, dear God, through this time, this difficult time. Lead us through this day, dear God. And Lord, may we, what, all that we do, honor you and bring you praise. Amen. Praise Him enough for the cross of Calvary. I could never thank Him enough for salvation, full and free. I could never do anything to deserve such perfect love. Oh, for everything He's done, I could never praise Him enough. For many years I've served. Praise Him enough for the cross of Calvary. 
me. I could never thank him enough for salvation full and free. I could never do anything to deserve such perfect love. Oh, for everything he's done. morning. I'm reading from the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 1, and I'm reading from the New International Version. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters, and he owned 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 5,000 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the peoples of the East. His sons used to take turns holding feasts in their homes, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would send and have them purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming through the earth and going back and forth in it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face." The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby. Then the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. And while he was speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the sky and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them, and they are dead, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up and tore his robe and shaved his head, and then he fell on the ground in worship and said, Naked came I from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all of this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I was approaching my 20th birthday. I had been in the army for almost a whole year. For most of that year, I had a dull pain in the upper right part of my back. At times, it got so strong it woke me up. And oftentimes, when I went to the toilet, 
I found that the toilet was bloody. A few times I went on sick call and I was given aspirin and then sent back to duty. That had been going on for the entire year. The cause of my problem was that I had two large kidney stones and they had blocked the ureter that was leaving my right kidney. The urine began to back up and the kidney began to swell and it became infected over that year. And finally, large cysts began to form on the outside of the kidney, increasing the size of the kidney. I was in danger of the infection getting to my remaining kidney. And the doctor said that that right kidney had to come out. It was his opinion that the situation was so far advanced that he believed that I would die within a very few years, perhaps within four or five years, when the other kidney failed. I laid in my bed at the hospital reading and rereading the book of Job. He suffered the same ways we all could suffer. He lost his family, tragically. He was wiped out financially. And at last, he lost his own personal health. And in reading his story, I saw my suffering and his suffering. I think we all can. I had been drafted, but I'd refused to get a college deferment. I was a medic and I was working hard to serve the sick and the injured through our MASH hospital. I worked in a coffee house ministry during my off hours in personal evangelism and had won a number of people to the Lord. I ran a, a once weekly Bible study for the 32 new believers that I had won to the Lord in this coffee house ministry. I was doing what I felt God was directing me to do. The problem for me was the same problem that Job had. It wasn't that I was suffering. It was that I didn't feel like I deserved what was going on. Like Job, I turned my face toward God and I asked, why me? And then I turned to the Bible and I began reading in the book of Job and I found God's answer. Now for me, it was a satisfying answer. It may not be a satisfying answer for you. You'll have to speak to God about that. But here is what I learned when I was reading the book of Job at the ripe old age of 20 years old. The first thing I learned was that all suffering is not a punishment for sin. Every man's suffering is not an indication of the measure of their guilt. There truly are godly people who suffer. I want you to think about all the innocent infants who over the years have suffered bitterly what could they possibly be guilty of? And yet, it seems like that when people are going through terrific sufferings, one of the first things my 42 years of experience of a pastor has taught me that those people think is, dear God, what have I done to deserve this? The answer may be nothing. And that was the first thing that occurred to me. Second, I learned that my relationship with God wasn't a closed relationship, and that was startling to me. I thought that, that it was Jesus and me. I really thought that my relationship with God was a closed relationship, but it really isn't. We're not in some kind of a, a hothouse with a controlled temperature, just us and God, and, and he sees to our, all of our needs, and we grow accordingly. That's not really happens. Look at this story in verse 9. Satan intrudes on the relationship between Job and God. And how does he do that? Well, in 9 through 11, he makes an accusation against us to God. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You've blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and his herds spread throughout the land. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. You know what the accusation is? The accusation is that Job is actually a pretty selfish man. And the only reason he has a relationship with God is because of the good things God will do for him as a result of that relationship. What can I get out of him? I remember reading Dr. C.S. Lewis talk about being a chaplain and doing chaplain's work during World War II. And he was addressing a group of uh, young officers uh, who were going out to fight in North Africa. And while he was talking to them about faith, one man stood up and said, look, I just don't believe in this Christian stuff you people talk about. I know I have to be here and listen to this lecture, 
but I totally disagree with what you're saying, Dr. Lewis. For one thing, I think all Christians are selfish. Whenever I hear them talking about things, they talk about things like heaven and streets of gold and, uh, you know, pie in the sky, by and by, good things happening to them all the time. I think Christians are basically selfish people, and they found a God who they can worship for their own selfish ends. And Dr. Lewis said to him, well, I've got a couple of things I would like to say to you. First of all, there's either pie in the sky, by and by, or there's not. My Bible says that there is, and I choose to believe what the Bible says. And secondly, I think you've got something terribly wrong in your mind somehow. There's nothing in heaven that a greedy soul would be able to find enjoyable. It's not about selfishness. It's about serving the Lord. And so the devil attacks as a tempter to try to turn us away from God. And what does he do in chapter 2, verse 9? He literally uses Job's wife. Verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. Where did we hear those words before? It was in the first chapter. Those are the words of the devil. Job's wife is literally saying what the devil wants her to say and is attacking God to Job. First he attacks Job to God. He's a selfish man. And now he attacks God to Job and tries to break up the relationship between them. The advice comes from somebody that Job, Job really loves. And it's a temptation. And it's actually an easy answer if you think about it. When things are going badly and you can't find a quick answer, the easiest thing in the world is just to turn your back on God and blame him for everything. But Job would not turn away, but just kept waiting. He was facing God, looking directly in his face and asking, why me? I, when I kept reading the book of Job over and over again in that hospital, I kept thinking the same thing. Look, God's got the answer. And uh, I believe he'll give me an answer. And I just kept asking him over and over again, how come these medics for a whole year ignored my physical condition? Why didn't they treat me properly? How come I wasn't given proper testing? Why didn't they take me seriously when I was in, in training? And, uh, and, and, and now they've, they've caused me to lose my kidney. And, and I really was upset about that. But I kept asking God, why me? I don't know if you've ever had kidney stones, but I can tell you it's extremely painful. And the pains just come suddenly and without warning, and they can be crippling. And when I finally had my kidney out for the next four days, I was pretty much in agony. The doctor was in a hurry to go skiing, and so when he operated on me, he accidentally clipped a nerve he didn't intend to clip, and that left me in a lot of pain. And so he'd ordered the nurses simply to keep me drugged for the next four days. The only problem with that was, that's a fine. They'd come in and give me a shot. Okay. Uh, within the next few minutes, I was unconscious. Fifteen or twenty minutes later, I would wake up. For the next 45 minutes, I was slowly drifting back into pain. And for the next three hours, I was in agony because I couldn't have a shot until four hours had gone by. And I went through that for four days, just chewing on my tongue and trying to survive those long three hours watching the second hand go around the face of that big old clock that hung in that six-man room where I was in the hospital. The advice comes from somebody that Job loves. But Job just keeps looking at God and asking God. You know, if Satan's right, Job only serves God for selfish reasons. You know what that means? That means that Job's a sinner and that God's a fool. The scripture tells us that Job was a righteous man. And we all know that God is not a fool. And so what does that mean? It means the devil's a liar. And that was one of the things that occurred to me. Whatever the devil is saying to me, I need to not pay attention to it because it's not the truth. He said that once Job is robbed of every outward sign of God's favor, that Job would curse God to his face and die. But Job refused to do that when all those outward signs were removed. We really see him in such a horrible situation that when finally Satan touches Job's body and he's stricken with these 
awful boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his foot, and he's sitting there in his agony and, and suffering, and his wife is making these suggestions, you ought to curse God and die. We find out that he, he will not do it. Look at uh, chapter 2, verse 7. And so Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. And then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he replied, You're talking like a foolish woman. Shall I accept good from God and not trouble? I think that was the answer that I found when Job said that. I remembered what my life was like when I first came in the church with my buddy, uh, Steve Nestor. His mother made him come. I remember how confused and how troubled it was and all the things that were going on wrong in my life. And I remember what happened after the day I was saved and came to the altar and prayed through and found Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I remember all the things that I learned from then on, growing up in the Lord. And I, I, I knew about the blessings that God gave. Have you ever talked to somebody about their soul who's troubled and upset and lead them to Christ and see the change on the person's face when they find the Lord? I had 32 brand new believers in my class that I had won to the Lord. And I was teaching them daily out of the book of Romans. And I kept thinking of all the blessings that God had poured out in my life and the things that he had done for me. Yeah, I was in a lot of pain and I was in a lot of trouble and I couldn't quite understand why it was happening to me. But I remember that God had done an awful lot of good things for me. And I remember that God had forgiven me of my sins. I remember the Sunday that, that the preacher was speaking. He was a minister from Indiana. His name was Gene Phillips. I don't remember what Gene said. But I do remember that when I got up from the pew to come to the altar, that I knew immediately when I stepped out in the aisle that the Lord had forgiven me of my sins. I felt that in my soul. And I can't tell you what joy and what relief uh, that gave me and, and how the confusion seemed to melt away. Are we going to just accept good things from God? I think Job's asking the right question here. It was a satisfying answer for me. I didn't know what the future held. I didn't know whether the doctor was right, whether I only had four or five years to live. Turns out, since I'm 67 now, he was wrong. But I did know that those four or five years with Christ was better than anything that I had enjoyed those years before. And I was going to accept whatever came my way as long as I could stay close to the Lord. Curse God and die? No, devil, I don't think so. And I don't care who you send to suggest that to me. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Job teaches us to trust God no matter what we're going through because we're not worshiping God because of what he does for us. We're worshiping him because of who he is to us. He's our God.